My name is Wesley Lucas. I am a librarian at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Uh, this is our first live event for our brand new book club uh, called Read to Win the War. And you can look for us on Goodreads. Uh, we've got a group started there with discussion boards and hopefully we can incorporate live events like this in the future. Um, we're lucky enough to be joined by the author of our first book, uh, Neil Bascom. Uh, he is a national award-winning and New York Times best-selling author of several books of narrative nonfiction, including Hunting Eichmann and its young adult companion, The Nazi Hunters, which Neil actually presented on uh, at the National World War II, World War II Museum uh, last November when we opened up a traveling exhibit on Eichmann. Uh, it was a great talk, and it's actually still available to stream on the museum's website if you just uh, search for uh, Neil Bascom on there. Um, in that talk, Neil, you said, uh, I look for stories about people doing what we think is impossible, stories about ordinary people being put in extraordinary situations and coming through it. Uh, and I would certainly say that description fits uh, your recent book and our book club's first read, uh, Faster, How a Jewish Driver, an American Heiress, and a Legendary Car Beat Hitler's Best. Uh, welcome, Neil, and thank you so much for being here to discuss your book. Thank you, I appreciate uh, you having me and picking me as the first book club. I'm excited about this and thank you everyone for, for joining in and looking forward to answering questions and talking about the book. Awesome. So let's dive right in, I suppose. Um, I guess for me, the, the biggest takeaway from this, or you know, just the biggest part of the book that, was, that affected me was, the, um, was nationalism and its role in sports. Uh, certainly at this time in the 30s, and then it makes you think about it all the way up to today. Um, on our Goodreads page, we actually had that discussion as one of the discussion questions that Neil provided, uh, touching on uh, the mix of nationalism and sports, um, why Hitler was so interested in motorsport, and why he wanted Germany to be, uh, you know, an exceptional team in motorsport. So, um, Neil, I guess I was going to say, yeah, if you would just talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I remember you wrote something that said, like, nationalism infected the Grand Prix. That's a really powerful word there. Um, what did you mean by that? Well, prior to, you know, over the, over the course of motor racing history, um, you find periods of time where nationalism and competition between uh, the states of, of Europe was more important than, than other points. And you saw that uh, prior to World War I, uh, where you had Germany and France really going head to head um, on every race. And it was less about the drivers and less about the cars than it was what country they were from and who was winning uh, a particular Grand Prix. And over the course of the, after the war, World War I, you found that sort of nationalism sort of went away. And it became, uh, motorsport became something that was very much about the cars, about the individual drivers. Um, there was a sense of camaraderie around the drivers. Um, there was a sense of, uh, you know, just general goodwill um, between these drivers and they would bounce uh, between teams and, and cars and a Frenchman would be driving a German car and an Italian would be driving a French car. Um, and it didn't really matter what country you were from. It was, you're in the best car that you can get to, um, and it doesn't matter what country. With the rise of, of Mussolini, I think first and foremost, uh, Mussolini was the sort of first actor to, to, to make motorsport, to make Alfa Romeo uh, and Maserati um, Italian cars. And that, that Italian angle was more important than brand. Um, and then you have uh, Hitler very much parroting uh, what Mussolini did. And in fact, you, you find that in other instances as well. Uh, uh, Hitler sort of realizing the sort of power that motorsport could have as a nationalistic symbol. And he subsequently sort of took that on and as, and as, as he did with most things, sort of hyper accentuated it. Um, and so by 1934, you have the Third Reich uh, investing in uh, huge sums of money and in pouring into the automobile manufacturers of Mercedes and Auto Union, uh, making the teams almost wholly German uh, and surrounding these teams with propaganda 
that would raise, uh, you know, the great German drivers as the paragons of the Third Reich. So you have Rudi Caracciola, Bernd Rosemeyer, uh, and Goebbels' propaganda machine really just pumping overtime uh, to make sure that every victory uh, was a German victory or a Nazi victory. And that, as, as, as your question implies, infected uh, motorsport. It became a situation where uh, countries or makers that did not have the investments um, from, their, uh, from their federal governments, uh, particularly the French um, and the British, in fact, uh, that their cars were falling way behind and the Germans were dominating things. And in fact, between 1934 and 1937, they just absolutely ruled uh, the Grand Prix. And uh, so that's, that's what I say, uh, this sort of infection happened. Uh, and you saw it uh, similarly, not to go on, uh, you saw it similarly uh, with, of course, the Olympics um, in, in 36, you have Jesse Owens, uh, you have the boxing matches um, that were also nationalized, but I think motorsport took it to a whole new level. Um, and in many reasons, because motorsport was about more than just motorsport. Oh, actually, you just kind of segued perfectly into, you know, another topic related to that, which is that, like you said, it was more than just nationalistic pride for Hitler. Uh, you write about how the NSKK, the, the organization that was built to, to grow motorsport in Germany, uh, was actually intended to grow the mobilization of the military in Germany. And in fact, once the war began, they became a fully militarized outfit, correct? Uh, yes. So the, the, when Hitler rose to power, uh, in 1933, the, the, one of the first speeches he, uh, he gave, and that was the second speech he ever gave, uh, was at the Berlin Motor Show. And at the Berlin Motor Show, he made it very clear this sort of four-step program that, that he wanted to do. Uh, first, he wanted to build a people's car, uh, sort of economize uh, and put every German in an automobile. Uh, the second thing he wanted to do, and, and Part and parcel with that is grow and expand and revitalize the German automobile industry, which meant busting up labor unions, uh, cutting taxes, um, and export uh, taxes. Uh, third, he wanted to build uh, the Autobahn and build a nationalized uh, highway system. Uh, and the fourth thing, as you mentioned, Leslie, uh, was to uh, dominate uh, motorsport. And that was and the reason he wanted to dominate motorsport, not only for propaganda, but with the development of the NSKK, which is the, the National Socialist uh, Motorsport Corps, um, was that this organization's uh, reason for existence was to recruit uh, drivers and mechanics. And so the more popular and the, and the more victories that Mercedes and auto unions have, uh, the greater draw, the NSKK, because each one of those German motor drivers, they were NSKK members. They were paramilitary members. You had to be uh, in order to drive for the Germans. Uh, and so you have a situation where every victory brings in more uh, uh, ranks to the NSKK. It was extremely successful. They drew in hundreds of thousands of young drivers uh, and mechanics. They gave uh, driving schools. And, and all of that was uh, intended uh, to populate the, the military and the infantry, uh, motorized infantry. And so by the time the Blitzkrieg happens and war breaks out, there's just an army of NSKK members ready to, to man the trucks and the tanks and, and to, to manage them and, and everything else. It's super interesting, uh, you know, because we're talking about nationalism sport and sometimes it's just, most of the time, it just seems to be about pride, but this is one of those cases where they were super intertwined. Um, and that makes me think about something you, you already mentioned as well about the drivers and how they treated that. And for the most part, what I got from your book was that the drivers, they were out for their own victories. They really weren't so tied up in that. Uh, obviously, the Germans had to be a part of the NSKK, so there was a different level there, but, um, you know, Rene switches teams and cars, uh, you know, goes to Italy when he's, um, you know, shunned by uh, Bugatti. So 
you know, what's your take on the drivers, you know, roles in this? Were they really kind of, you know, just out for themselves or do you think there was more connection there? I think it largely depended on, you know, a case by case basis, the driver by driver, um, you know, but I think in general, your, your point is correct. I think the drivers were um, less interested in politics. Um, you know, the, the key German drivers, uh, Kerchill, uh, uh, Rosemeyer, um, they were not, um, you know, I would say eager Nazi members, uh, eager NSKK members. Uh, they wanted to drive, they wanted to win. Uh, and in order to be a member of the Mercedes team and the auto union team, you had to join the NSKK. You had to play the game. Uh, you had to become the, the uh, you know, uh, tough as Krupp steel as the, as the, as the propaganda went. Uh, and write editorials and publish books and be in the films. Um, and so, you know, I'm not excusing that behavior. Like, I think that Rudy Caracciola and Rosemeyer um, knew that they were symbols of the Great Reich um, and they became wealthy from that. Uh, they were able to drive the best cars for that and they were willing to sacrifice, you know, I think their soul, it might be putting it a little bit uh, harshly, um, but they were willing to do that not out of fervor for what Hitler believed or for the for the Third Reich, but because they wanted to drive. Um, and you know, I think to a to an individual, they you know whether they were German or French or Italian uh, or Spanish or elsewhere, you know they these drivers they regretted what was happening uh, to motorsport come 1934. Like they missed the camaraderie, they missed the sense of traveling together, of of drinking together and dining together and and, and being mates. Um, because by 1934. You know, even when they were at hotels before the races uh, or in the pits, uh, you know, they were segmented into their teams, into their nations. Uh, the rivalry was so much greater. The fans were, you know, uh, one-sided um, to whoever team they were, they were, they were rooting for. And so it, it really, you know, in many ways, kind of both poisoned the sport, uh, but also made it simultaneously more exciting uh, and more uh, crowd drawing and the technology had become, and we could probably address this later, but like the speed and the, the nimbleness of these cars because of all the money being poured into um, them, particularly by the Germans, you know, the speeds increased vastly from the, from the early 1930s to by 1938, these cars are going 250 miles per hour. I mean, from a hundred. So you're talking like just what a race looked like, sounded like, uh, the speed of the cars just had, had you know, it was night and day um, because of this nationalism. And another point to continue on there uh, about the amount of money that's poured in by governments into these teams. As you said, Germany was leading the way on that and the others were trying, other countries were trying to catch up. But one thing I found interesting was that race uh, for a million francs in France, because you just, well, the context, of the situation in the country at the time, how they were avoiding war because their economy was pretty much bust and their government was dysfunctional. But even with their economy being shot like that, they managed to, you know, tax people's driver's license fees and then collect enough to offer a million dollars to a car company that seems pretty crazy that the country is, you know, in an economic, you know, uh, slump on the brink of war with their neighbor again, and they're going to break off a million bucks to build a car. That's, that's some crazy nationalism in sport right there. No, absolutely. <laughs> Just break in, you know, I'll go to that, but I think uh, we have a comment here from Walter Wolf saying, you, you know, that the drivers faced what, what they call the Lenny Riefenstahl issue, which was sacrificing integrity to work with the Nazis. And Walter, I think you're exactly right. Uh, that's probably much better put than I did. Um, now, just having back to uh, what, uh, what you said about the, the French. I mean, the French, they were getting lambasted uh, by uh, you know, the, the popular French newspapers, the, the motorsport journals, uh, by the fact that the Bugatti, 
uh, was absolutely getting killed uh, at every race. And at the French Grand Prix, this, you know, the French, you know, the French Grand Prix was the original Grand Prix. And, you know, the Germans sweeping one, two, and three, and they just uh, excoriated the uh, French automobile industry. And so something had to be done by, you know, 1936, uh, 1937. And so sort of the, the, the champions of French motorsport um, gathered around and said, we got to figure out something to do here. Um, and so that led to the Million Franc Prize, which was to, you know, to create a competition, um, maybe an early version of the space race, create a competition to build a, a, a national French Grand Prix car. Uh, and what's so interesting to me and what I love so much about this story was that it wasn't Bugatti, which was the sort of premier French uh, maker at the time that, that, that won this race. It was a largely defunct, um, almost bankrupt uh, Delahaye company uh, that, that really, that, that won the million franc. And so the story behind how that happened is just, you know, going back to what you said about the kind of books that I write, it really was a David and Goliath story. It was a super interesting aspect of it. Um, and since you mentioned that they, you know, De La Haye was not the favorite to win it and they won it fair and square, the next year when they awarded that same prize, uh, De La Haye should have been a shoe in having won two Grand Prix and some other races, but they actually gave it to, uh, oh, was it Talbot or was it Bugatti? Yeah, it was tough. Uh, tough. Yeah, and that was a political thing. They had just curry favor with them. So, you know, again, another case of that uh, politics infiltrating sports there. Um, and then one more just point on that nationalism and sports discussion, uh, the Olympics, as you kind of brought up briefly, I thought there were some cool quotes that you pulled. Um, I think it was a writer, Klimper, said, I find the Olympics so odious because they are not about sports, in this country, I mean, but are an entirely political enterprise. And then a La Auto columnist wrote about the great lesson of the games, uh, that athletic success was now indelibly intertwined with the prestige and power of a nation. Uh, the age of sport is now consecrated, deplored or approve it, but you will not change it. I couldn't agree more because you obviously illustrate that so well in the book. And then I'll just throw in a personal anecdote. Um, I'm a Newcastle United fan, Premier League soccer. <laughs> and uh, they have had a terrible uh, owner for 13 years, and he's finally about to sell up to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and that is not exactly who you want running your sports group. And there's all this outcry about it right now. And the, the, the key term is uh, sports washing, where if you're, you know, a beleaguered company or, or individual or even a country uh, or royal family, you can try to curry favor internationally by buying a top sports team and uh, filling it with money until it succeeds and it just, you know, washes away all of your criminal activity. So as a Newcastle fan, I'm quite split on how to uh, deal with this, but it's a modern case of, of how, um, you know, uh, how these national groups will try to clean up their image uh, or promote themselves through sport. Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote a book, uh, gosh, from 15, 16 years ago about uh, Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile. And that was really, you know, in 1954 when he did it, it was sort of that pivot point between amateur, amateurism and professionalism uh, in regard to sport. And this sort of ideal of what an athlete should be, you know, a doctor who is, you know, only trains during his lunch hour uh, for <laughs> an American uh, track star who's, you know, who's doing two a days every day and has, you know, a dozen coaches and all the food he wants and, and just this sort of dichotomy between this. And I think you can, you find that similarly back in this, in this period in the nationalism of sport. I think it was, you know, what Hitler did to the 36 Olympics. I mean, there's, there's reasons that they're, you know, that the Jesse Owens story is so popular or Boys in the Boat uh, is, is so popular because, you know, it really is this pivot point for nationalism and sport. And I think, you know, you look at the Chinese Olympics that we had a, a few years back and yeah. what, uh, what a presence and what awe uh, they inspired by um, their opening and closing ceremonies and they, it, just the level of investment that they put into that. Um, it's just remarkable. Um, 
you know, you could also talk about Miracle on Ice, you know, the German, uh, the Americans versus the Russians. I think, you know, a lot of this echoes back um, to what happened uh, in Germany uh, in the 36 Olympics. Super fascinating. And I could go on as a, as a sports fan, I could go on about that forever, but I, I guess we'll do a slight pivot here from that topic. Um, the, the next thing I was going to touch on and, and, you know, we will certainly get to Rene Dreyfus because he's kind of the guy driving the car. You got to appreciate his role in this. But um, I was actually mostly captivated by Lucy Shell, the financer and female race driver. Um, she kind of stole the show for me uh, just because, yeah, you never, you hardly see that today, let alone in the 30s. Um, and you did well, I thought, to describe some of the some of the struggles she went up against in terms of men running things and her having to try to be forceful to get her way, which she often was. Um, and, you know, you had some great, great quotes about that, which I'll try to pull up. But anyway, I was going to see if you'd talk about um, Lucy Shell and what she represents uh, for you and, and feminism and sports as well. Yeah, it was, it was just such an absolute uh, pleasure to, to, to write about her. I have to say that, like, you know, I've written a lot of books now in, in my career and, and almost all of them have been uh, about men. <laughs> and I don't know why that is, but, but, but uh, it's just the virtue of the stories that attracted me. And it was so refreshing to, um, to focus on the, the, the dynamo that was Lucy Shell. I mean, she, she, you know, it was very hard for me to write her and, and for it not to, it just came so easily and she just kind of burst on the page. You know, I found that, it, and she was a bit of a tough nut to crack because, you know, there wasn't a lot of archival material on her. You know, neither of her uh, two sons um, left any papers. And so most of what I discovered about her came through the papers that, that were around Delahaye and, and Renee Dreyfus. So in some ways she, you know, her legacy, which is kind of lost, uh, was was you know was refound through through the men who got most of the credit in the first place, uh, when in fact Lucy was you know the first woman to launch, run, uh, lead uh, a Grand Prix race team, uh, which you know if you asked a dozen motorsport uh, historians who that first woman was, I bet you'd stump a, quite a few of them. Um, and, you know, she was a tough nut to crack, but then I found this um, newspaper that, this French newspaper, uh, whose journalist or whose editor, I guess was just a fan of hers. Uh, and so you, I found dozens of articles in there um, and there was no index for this. So I was like combing through, I went through every, uh, you know, for the historians out there listening, you know, I went through every single day of this uh, French newspaper from, I think, 1928 uh, through 1939, uh, looking for stories on Lucy, uh, and just found some terrific ones. In particular, that, um, like an eight-part series about her uh, Monte Carlo Rally, Rally Drive uh, in 1932-33. And that, you know, they had, she had a journalist in the car with her, and so you got a real sense of like who she was, you know, I think one of my favorite lines in the book, and I, you know, uh, I largely stole it from the from the journalist with credit, uh, uh, that, you know, the, the more difficult things got on the road, the icier they, they were, the more dangerous it became, the sort of bigger her smile was. Um, and that really tells you everything you need to know about Lucy Shell, and particularly, but also this dynamic between her and her husband, Lori, uh, which was so... Uh, sort of shifted on its head, the kind of, you know, male, typical male versus typical female roles. Um, you know, Lori was the, was the one who sort of just helped things along. <laughs> and, 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 Laura, and Lucy was the one who dominated the room and who made the decisions. Uh, and Lori was there and supportive and, and um, was also just this wonderful character. So, you know, their relationship, I've had many people tell me that Lori and Lucy were their favorites. Um, and what I also found interesting about her, and I guess what I'm most proud about uh, in terms of, of the book is, is revitalizing her legacy. 
and sort of opening the window to this this early speed queen who you know deserves like the New York Times is doing the, these days you know um, new obituaries of of, of mm -hmm. women of, of of note who didn't get them uh, at the time of their death like Lucy deserves that like she is she's definitely one of those pioneers uh, those break the glass ceiling kind of people. Um, and uh, I just can't talk enough about her. So feel free to ask me any questions. <laughs> I couldn't agree more that she is just super fascinating. And, um, and since there's really nothing out there about her, uh, your book definitely is one of the few points serving as a, a good pedestal for her. Um, because yeah, you definitely drew me in. You know, that description of that, that rally race with the writer in the backseat was just, it blew my mind about her resolve uh, and, you know, just, skill and stamina but also um about rally racing in general man what a crazy what a crazy sport yeah, that is. Right? yeah i mean i i knew all, almost nothing about rally driving uh, mm -hmm. and i read probably a dozen rally books um and just this sort of madness of it and this cannonball run uh sort of vibe that that it had but the rally was was huge news uh back then like you couldn't you can't open a motorsport magazine and back in the in back in the day i mean they were, they were motorsport writing was fantastic and there were lots of great magazines um and you know they covered every day of that rally um you know where they were who who died along the way who crashed uh you know and it was just just absolute uh madness uh and you know lucy and Lori, they were they were the top uh, American Monte Carlo rally drivers for, for a number of years. Yeah, makes it all the more impressive. Um, just another note on Lucy, I was going to throw out a couple of great quotes that you included in the book. Um, after Delahaye won the million, dollar, million franc prize, uh, she was quoted, again, seldom was mention made of Lucy Shell, despite efforts by Renee to highlight her role as the creator of Ecurie Blue. Um, I thought that was interesting because, and I guess maybe I was wondering if you could elaborate on some, it seemed as if Renee and uh, Monsieur Charles uh, Wiefenbach, uh, the, uh, the French um, Delahaye owner, um, yeah. it seemed like the two of them respected her a lot and, and obviously gave her what she needed to do, to do what she wanted to do. But so I was wondering, could you maybe expand on that some, if you have any more info on their relationship? Yeah, I mean, there was just, you know, um, Charles Weifenbach in particular, who was this sort of very old school French uh, patrician uh, character, you know, uh, I just, you know, when I pictured or imagined every time they were together, you know, this brash, say what you think, uh, lady coming in and demanding cars and more cars and faster cars and better built cars. Um, and, you know, you definitely get the sense from Charles or Monsieur Charles, as he was called, um, that he didn't know quite know what to do with her initially. Um, and he kind of, you know, in, 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 at first blush, he was, was kind of annoyed and wanted her out of his office. But as their relationship grew, you got the sense of this mutual respect and you know, by virtue of the fact that like Lucy was there, you know, when they were test driving the car, like if Renee wasn't there, she was in the car, uh, speeding it around the track, uh, that she was willing to, you know, uh, really invest her fortune uh, into racing and sort of never back down. Um, I think Charles uh, immensely uh, respected her. And I think similarly, Renee Dreyfus had that initial hesitancy when she first recruited him. I mean, he was kind of desperate, you know, I mean, he, he didn't have a team, um, didn't have a car to drive. And, and this, this woman who he knew only tangentially comes to him and says, well, I'm starting a, a Grand Prix team. I mean, the absurdity of it, it you know, from his perspective, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, just from the nature of the times, uh, he was, you know, he had to be won over. And in part, he did it because he was desperate, not because he thought that, that this was a surefire win. In fact, he thought that it probably was going to go south. Uh, and, and, and many times he debated, you know, backing out. Um, but over the course of time, again, their relationship became one of, 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 of very good friendship. 
And in fact, I would say that Lucy Shell inspired Renee, and I try to make this point faster, like inspired him to be a better driver, uh, a more uh, risky driver in some sense, you know, really pushing himself. Uh, he was always prior to that a careful individual. And I think that Renee knew that, respected that. And whenever a race was over, when the million franc happened or the, the victory at Poe, like she was the first one and Charles too, to give Lucy credit. And what's so interesting is that the press uh, very rarely reported that. And I found in this, again, for the historians in there, in here, you know, in, in Florida uh, at this automobile, the, the Revs Institute, in this one French writer's archives that for some reason are, are, are in Florida and, uh, you know, going through it. And I found this letter on Ecurie Blue uh, letterhead with the bulldog uh, stamp uh, and blue type. And this is a, a letter that Lucy is writing, the editor of, of this newspaper, Maurice uh, Philippe, uh, just, just lambasting him for not giving her credit uh, and saying that, uh, you know, this this team is is Lucy O'Reilly Shell's Ecury Blue, uh, not Shell's Ecury Blue, and by no means Lori's Ecury Blue. <laughs> um, and she's like, my husband, I run this team, I finance this team, and she made this very clear to him and said, do not repeat this uh, again. And you just got the sense in 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 this note um, that she wasn't going to put up with it. Even though, she, even though, in 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 essence, she had to. Right. No, excellent points, and um, and you kind of paraphrased uh, another quote that I just love from her about saying like, you know, don't get it wrong. This is my team. So, yeah, just can't again talk about her enough because she's a fantastic character in this whole, in this whole thing. Um, but I guess you also mentioned uh, another good topic to pivot to uh, Rene Dreyfus himself, the uh, Jewish French driver. Um, and you touched on uh, how she helped kind of uh, re-spark, you know, his his drive, so to speak. Uh, he had had someone tell him in the slump of his career that he needed something to fight for, and he he didn't seem to have something that drove him like that. So, uh, reading your book, you get the impression that not just her, but the political moment drove him, even though he didn't necessarily identify. As Jewish, and in fact, uh, converted to Catholicism just, uh, you know, for not necessarily religious purposes. But um, anyway, I guess I'd, I'd be interested to hear, you know, what what you had to say about that more his his motivation at that point. How much of it was him just wanting to get back on top? How much of it really was I'm a Jewish driver beating a German Nazi driver? You know. Yeah. So you know, I, I found. Rene to be, you know, a, a very a fascinating individual to write about because he, you know, in some ways he wasn't the kind of unalloyed hero, <laughs> you know, he uh, it had to be kind of pushed into it uh, by Lucy Shell, and, you know, I may have said but, I, but I, the, the quote is definitely out there, that he said that, that uh, you know, racing was his religion. Um, and, you know, he didn't consider himself Jewish. He didn't consider himself Catholic. You know, his niece told me that, that, that he never even spoke about religion. Like, it, it made no difference to him. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, parallels the, the, the Rudy Caracciolas of, of the world, of Bernd Rosemeyer's, like, Th their life was racing uh, and all this politics was just something that they had to uh, deal with. Um, but I think that, you know, Lucy's great contribution to Rene was for him, at least for a moment, uh, for a period of time to realize that it didn't matter if he considered himself Jewish. Uh, it didn't matter if he uh, went to the synagogue or went to the church. Um, that by virtue of the fact that his name was Dreyfus, uh, the, the most recognizable Jewish name uh, in Europe uh, at that time, you could argue probably quite easily, people considered him Jewish. And you have a sport and you have a nation like uh, Germany 
um, that would never let you on the team, uh, that is uh, already making fast strides uh, at the level of violent uh, anti-Semitism uh, in Germany, um, and that he could be a representative of victory over that, even if it was just symbolic, even if it, you know, it's not going to change the tides of war. Um, but, you know, there's power in symbols. And I thought that what was so great about Lucy, and I know we're back on Renee, was that, that, that she made Renee see that. And, um, and that was absolutely the case. You know, when, when the victory in Poe happened, um, it was an absolute embarrassment for the Germans uh, and for Hitler, not only because the French beat him, but because a French Jew uh, beat him beat them. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the impetus for, for my writing this book. I mean, it's this, this sort of powerful uh, story um, about that. And then when you have Lucy Shell, who's fighting her own sort of dynamics of, of misogyny, um, it just, it, it encapsulates so much. True, truly an underdog story, as you said, you know, all, all three of the main characters that came together for the team for fighting against different issues of their own. Uh, so let's see, um, just talking about Renee too, I thought it was really cool that you noted uh, uh, when the war got going, he actually ended up serving in both the French army and the US military once he moved to the United States. And that you noted um, he considered serving in the US military his proudest achievement. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to talk more about that. Yeah, so, you know, he, I think, oh, another great line that you have there um, in uh, in Renee's memoir is that he was on the on the ship uh, headed towards uh, uh, North Africa uh, and then uh, then into the invasion of, of Italy by the Allies. Is that you know people considered him the Babe Ruth of France uh, mm -hmm. at that point, right? So he's this uh, he's this celebrity. He's this you know Grand Prix driver. He's He's supposed to be this, uh, you know, rich, celebrated uh, uh, sport titan, uh, and and yet he was sort of forced out of France um, and kind of saved again by Lucy Shell, who got him to Indianapolis to race uh, shortly before. You know, he was on the boat actually uh, headed towards the U.S. Uh, when uh, the French or when the Germans invaded uh, France, and 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 very likely saved his life. Um, and so he's in America and, 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 and loves the country and wants to get back to Europe and participate in this fight. Um, and so he doesn't speak any English really. And so he has to learn English. Um, and then he, uh, he volunteered uh, initially and the, the army said, no, um, you, you know, you're foreign national, you can't do that. Um, and then eventually, you know, as, 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 as things changed and the, the recruitment process became a little easier uh, in the U.S., they, they let him in. And, you know, he, was, he saw some, some heavy fighting um, in the invasion of, of, of Italy, uh, then became an interpreter, um, and then eventually uh, moved into to, to France uh, soon after the withdrawal of the Germans. And, and, you know, it was just, it was something that, you know, I think he can, he considered it his great greatest contribution, uh, more important than motorsport. And he very much became an American after that. I mean, he was in France and his family was in France and he said, you know, our life, our future is in America. And he left, left there to New York and became uh, a, a very well-known French uh, restaurateur and the kind of epicenter of, 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 New York racing scene. And I think it's apt that the title of his uh, memoir is called uh, My Two Lives. Because he indeed, I would probably say he had three lives if, if, if you were you know, race car driver, um, time in the army, and then restaurant tour. Super impressive individual. And, and um, I know that that uh, autobiography is probably a, a really good read as well for that reason. Um, and yeah, and just another great American story when this all takes place in Europe, it turns out, you know, that he has one of those great immigrate post-World War II immigration stories to America. So I really, that, that sort of surprised me at the end. I didn't know that after I just generally looked him up. Um, 
great stuff on Renee. Um, let's see, I was, as a librarian, I can't help but ask about your writing process, your research process. Um, you know, you, you gave great credit to that in, in the back of the book. And then I read a LidHub article you did a few years back where you talked about your process and you couldn't talk about libraries and archives enough, which I appreciate. So um, sort of a multi-part question here. Uh, the initial inspiration for the store, you kind of just mentioned that, you know, uh, maybe a couple of friends of yours you, uh, brought this to your attention somehow or something. So I was wondering if you might elaborate on how you got into this story, and then if you wouldn't mind maybe going on and talking about some of your research process, uh, in particular, uh, primary resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I uh, originally, you know, I'm, as I've probably said in enough interviews uh, <laughs> over the course, I'm, you know, originally not a car guy, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I drive cars, I like to drive cars, but I don't, you know, I own a Subaru. I, I don't own a Ferrari, <laughs> right. uh, um, you know, and, um, you know, I always kind of wanted to write a motorsport history. I'm not quite sure why, but um, I just thought it's a fascinating scene and kind of crucible uh, to tell a story. Uh, but I couldn't find a project, and so I dismissed that probably over a dozen years ago. Uh, then I was in New York and a friend of mine at the Wall Street Journal passed me a press release about this car that had competed at the Pebble Beach Concours, uh, which the Germans uh, had tried to find after the invasion of France uh, and have destroyed. And then also went to the Automobile Club of France and had the, all the records eliminated um, because they wanted to erase the history of what Delahaye did. And so, you know, it just, I was, I was, I think I was very just fortunate and lucky to sort of stumble upon this really just lovely gem of a, of a story. Um, and then, so I found this gem and I was super excited about it. And I remember like I told my wife and I told my agents and I was like, okay, this is the next book. And so I began researching it, putting together the proposal. And then I just started hitting wall after wall after wall. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, Lucy Shell had no, no archives. Uh, Renee Dreyfus's um, papers sort of I couldn't find. Um, and I began to sort of like, you know, when I write these books, like, is, is, you know, I talk about libraries and archives so much. It's like, and to your point about the question, is like primary material is like the, the lifeblood of what we do. And if you're gonna tell a story in a visceral way, you're gonna I, sort of identify what people were thinking and feeling and what things smelled like and tasted like and looked like. Um, you need just an enormous sum of material and, and, and you, don't, you, you can't rely on secondary sources to provide that, you just can't. Um, because otherwise, why write it um, from my perspective? Um, I don't wanna retread what someone else has done. Um, and so I was fortunate to have a break and I would have decided, okay, I, I may be going on, but I decided I'm not going to do this. Uh, I can't do this book. Um, there's nothing out there. You know, I just, it's too bad, but, but that's life. Um, and then out of the blue, I got a, a letter from, uh, Evelyn Dreyfus, who was Renee's niece. Uh, and I had written her long before and hadn't heard anything and filed up and hadn't heard anything. Uh, and then she suddenly came into the picture and she lives in France and um, she sent me these, um, these two huge PDF files. Uh, she had taken photographs of the scrapbook um, that had been collected by the family over the course of oh. Renee's life, like all the articles written about him in wow. French and Italian and um, contemporary articles written at post-war interviews, um, probably five to 600 pages of material wow. uh, that including, you know, what was said at his funeral uh, huh. and the speech is there. And so I just, I got that and I was like, you know, that certainly did not win the day. Like that was, that was the beginning, but I, I, I kind of knew that, okay, I can go, I can, I can do this. Um, I would say some, some, what was interesting just to talk about the sort of primary thing is like in the motorsport world, it's a little different than it works in the other, like, you know, when I wrote Winter Fortress about stopping the Germans from obtaining the Nazi bomb, like 
archives and libraries um, like like the World War II Museum has, like you know, in Norway and in Germany, like there's just a wealth of material in the British archives. Like it was just standard operating procedure. It just was, you know, you had to go there and you had to spend weeks going through the files. Right. What's curious about motorsport history is that it's, and I've written this elsewhere, is it's, it's, it's localized, it's privatized, it's in individual private collections. Uh, it's, there's, there's very few sort of public collections of archival material. In fact, REVS in, in Florida is really one of the few. And so it was a situation where I had to sort of uh, infiltrate, for lack of a better word, <laughs> Um, the private collection uh, market for motorsport. And I was fortunate enough to, to, to have a guide in that named uh, Richard Adato, uh, who I met in Seattle, uh, who really was my uh, consigliere, for lack of a better word, um, in, in that world and really opened up a lot of doors. Uh, and I think the couple, couple other points I would say is that the, the, the Mercedes archives, um, those were the one sort of publicly available archive that was just an absolute treasure. Like they've kept everything. Um, and, you know, down to like uh, even mid race, they would be telegramming uh, Stuttgart uh, with reports about what's happening, uh, what the prognosis was, um, just every, you know, the times of every lap and, and, you know, even the preparations. And so I had the, that. And the final thing I would say is, and I reflected on this a little bit earlier, is that the, the, the quality of motorsport writing, the contemporaneous motorsport um, journals, magazine writers, and in some cases, book writers, uh, authors, uh, was just terrific. Um, you had very descriptive, lovely, um, visceral, to use the word again, accounts of all of these races in multiple languages. I mean, the Poe race alone, I had two, probably four by four scrapbooks, probably a thousand articles on one single race uh, in multiple languages. So I ultimately had, uh, you know, as, as any historian will, 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 will say, like, um, too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm not writing, writing a sequel, but uh, I could. That's awesome. And that's a good problem to have, I suppose, uh, too much material to get through. But you can really see how it came through with your description of the races, because it felt like you were in the seat, you know, uh, driving around. It was really uh, intense sometimes, very exciting. So uh, Thank you. you succeeded there. Um, nice plug for the Revs Institute. I actually communicated with Mark Vargas, the librarian there, when I was getting started here uh, to get some advice on our software, which we ended up going with the same stuff they have. So. Another plug for the Revs Institute in Florida. Great, great library and archive. Um, Mark is a lot. <laughs> good. I, he was super gracious and helpful for me as well. So I'm glad to hear it was the same. Um, I'm going to grab some questions out of the Q&A. But just before I do that, maybe just a minute on this. I, I would I would be mad at myself if I didn't ask you in person, like, how what, what was it like riding around in that uh, Delahaye, man, that, from the introduction? Uh, it, was, it was delicious. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I'm not a terribly pushy person, um, but I kind of pushed my way into, <laughs> into that car. I, I really wanted to do it not only for, you know, I, I thought it offered like a terrific way to open the book and I knew it would if I was actually in the car uh, and was able to experience what it was like to drive in it. Um, but it just was, I just, like I didn't want to write a whole book about a car and not experience driving it. And, and it was just so much fun. Um, and I want to thank Peter Mullen, um, the, the Mullen Museum um, in Oxnard is, is tremendous. Uh, if you're at all fascinated by uh, French, uh, French cars. Uh, and I thank again, Richard, who, who made that happen. It just was, was a ball and, and I'm, if I recall it again, I still get a little bit scared, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded somewhat terrifying, but just like you said, reading those descriptions of the, of the races, you just wanted to feel it. So it's cool to hear that you were able to get a taste of that. Um, okay, I guess I will 
jump into some of the questions. We've got a few folks that threw some questions into the Q&A. Um, I, I, this is kind of going back on a little bit of stuff we talked about, um, but we only touched on it. And there's a couple questions here, so maybe just spend a minute or two on these. Um, but uh, from our Goodreads page, one of our book club members actually um, had posted a question just before this. And they were curious uh, about Rudy Caracciola, uh, you know, from your perspective. I, I'll admit that for me, he was definitely a very complicated character. And, and you did touch on him earlier uh, briefly, but um, just to maybe another minute or two about um, Rudy and how complex of an individual he was in, in, in such an awkward position. Yeah, I mean, what's so interesting is, is you know, Renee and Rudy were very, you know, they were friends, you know? Um, they would travel together. Their wives, uh, or, or, you know, in some cases, lovers uh, knew each other very well. Um, they were on the road together. And so you have this, um, you know, split that happens because of the of the nationalism that's the first thing um and sort of separate and put a divide between these drivers and i would say particularly the case with renee who was forced from all these teams uh and you know could very well have driven for mercedes but by virtue of the fact that he was jewish was told unequivocally that's never going to happen so you can imagine what that that did from renee's perspective uh, and rudy had to know that i mean they were close um and so uh, and yet he went on. Um, I, I think it's important to put Rudy into context, though. Um, one, driving was his life, as I had mentioned before. Uh, two, he has this terrifically bad accident that, that, that permanently cripples him, uh, and he believes he's never going to race again. Uh, then he loses his wife uh, in a tragic skiing accident. And so by the end of 1933, he is a man who can't drive, um, is, is, believes he's permanently disabled, and he's lost the love of his life. And he says very clearly in his, his, his memoirs, and, and he wrote several of them, um, that there was no other life for him than racing at that point. Like he was, he was a lost soul. Um, if he didn't get back into racing. And so he was willing to do whatever it took um, to get back into the seat of the car. Um, and it probably would have been that way, whether it was just a great depression that kept Mercedes out. But I think by virtue of the fact that of the terrible accident and the loss of his wife, I think it just, it multiplied things for him. And, and and as, as, as Walter said, you know, he, he was more than willing at that point to sacrifice his integrity to, to get back into the seat of the race car and be the best. Like that's, as he wrote, the, the only time in his life where things made sense was when he was behind the wheel racing at, you know, 150 miles an hour. Um, and so, uh, so he made the sacrifice, you know, he joined the SKK. Um, he became this uh, propaganda prop. Um, and that was the price he was willing to, willing to pay. I think he, you know, he got out as soon as he could. Uh, he didn't participate in the war. He very happily lived in Switzerland. Um, you know, again, he's a, he's, he's a complicated character. And I think the, the Third Reich, um, you know, made those kind of choices for people all over the place. And he's, he's, he's one of them. Um, and he's neither all good nor all bad. That's a great description. Um, and it actually kind of, there's, we've just got a few minutes more, but I noticed that there's a few questions that are somewhat related and uh, kind of touch on what we discussed earlier in this uh, about nationalism and just the desire to drive versus, you know, how much it represents a country or a government. Um, one person asked, uh, you know, how did they, how did they feel that uh, Tazio Nuvolari was an Italian, turned out to be one of the better drivers for the German team. They allowed uh, some Italians, and I think I even remember an Englishman on the race team for a bit. And then another person asked, uh, did anyone in France kind of beef with the fact that it was an American heiress who was, who was financing uh, the French car? So two different questions, but kind of on the same note, how, how important was it, you know, uh, that they that they were French or Italian or they just wanted to win? 
Yeah, I think the I'll, I'll answer the second one first. Um, with Lucy and her, by virtue of the fact that she was American, I mean, she was, her mother was French, uh, her father was American. Uh, she was raised partly in Paris, she was born in Paris, um, raised sort of split time between Paris and Pennsylvania. She spoke French fluently. Um, she lived in, uh, out in the outskirts of, of Paris. So I think it, it, to all intents and purposes, uh, she was, she was a, French. Um, and I, I, I don't, I never saw one article or mention of, of there ever being an issue of, of, you know, and she picked a French driver and a French automobile manufacturer. I think if, if she would have chosen Ford, um, and had, you know, an American driver, I think it would have been a different, different uh, story. Um, you know, the, the question of, I'll take sort of Tazio Nuvolari as, as a sort of general point that, that the Germans were happy, not happy, they needed approval from up high, um, but they were willing to take Italians in particular um, because of the association uh, of Mussolini and Hitler. Um, and they even had a British driver, uh, Richard Seaman, um, on the team at this, at this point in 1938. Uh, but in relation to Tazio Nuvolari, like everyone wanted Tazio Nuvolari. I mean, he was, he was, you know, I think there's some point in, in, in the Q&A list of questions here, is, you know, you could probably theoretically argue who was better, Tazio or Rudy, just in, in the pure prowess of, of driving. Um, but I think if you, if you ask Rene Dreyfus who the best driver was, it was Tazio Nuvolari. Um, and, you know, he just was an absolute uh, killer and so talented and just had, was, you know, was such a different driver than Rudy. Um, but everyone wanted him. They knew he was the best. Uh, he, he, you know, it, in many ways, the Germans sort of like had pride in the fact that he was willing to even drive for them. Um, so I, I don't think nationalism uh, was a concern on that level. And even the Germans had a French driver at one point driving mm -hmm. uh, Louis Chiron. Uh, mm -hmm. He has not French, he was Monegasque, uh, but the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. And, but they wouldn't, uh, let's be clear, um, have Rene Dreyfus, uh, who in 1935 was one of the top drivers, was earning uh, in the top five money makers, uh, was a consistently good uh, driver was very good on the cars, uh, was very good team player. Um, he would have been an obvious choice more so than Louis Chiron uh, to be on a Mercedes team or an auto union team. And there was no way that was happening. Um, and so uh, it was nationalism, but it was also racism, uh, pure, pure and simple. And that is what gets to the heart of, of that, that whole period of time and, and what it brought about. So, um, Man, I definitely, I've got a whole extra list of things and I know some other folks uh, entered some questions, but I think we've reached our limit of time here. Um, this has been super, you know, illuminating to, the, to an already great book. So really thank you again for uh, joining us and, and adding all of your input on this. And I would certainly recommend anyone who hadn't read it and, interest, and enjoyed this to get out and pick it up. It was a really good read. So thanks again, Neil. Wow, it was a wonderful interview. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, everyone come visit the museum when it reopens and be safe. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch in the future for about more book club updates. Thanks for joining us.